if you don't know where the prayer room is, it's just, it's just back that way there. You would have passed the door on your way in. And uh, you know it's accessible. People can go there and pray in that space. It's used um, twice a week. You know, once on, some, on, on Sunday mornings it's used as a thoroughfare for crash. And then uh, partial care meet in there. The rest of the week, for an hour, it's used perhaps two hours a week. The rest of those hours is free. So if you have access to the building, you have access to that space to pray. It's really good. And thanks, Matt, for the plug. I'll try and speak faster for you today. Um, but uh, it's good. We're going to, uh, to continue our... Our theories, uh, we're going to move on a few hundred years, quite a number of hundreds of years, past lots and lots and lots of examples of people who have lived by faith, who show a great example for, of the gospel. And uh, when I ask God about all these missing people, I was concerned we weren't going to talk about them. God said, don't worry, just go with them. As we know, those of you who were here last Sunday, our direction in this series is to prepare us for our whole of church focus in the third term. We're going to talk about gospel renewal and revival. And we've been doing this whole of church sort of thing for almost five years. And we've been moving towards this space by God's grace and by His Spirit. For context around this passage this morning, um, which comes from two kings, we need to know a few things. This is the time of the divided nation, not one Israel, but we have uh, Israel to the north, Judah to the south. Each had its own king and its own prophets who ministered to them. Uh, Israel is to the north, Judah is to the south, and uh, this story has to do with Elisha. Do not confuse Elisha with Elijah, because they get upset when you confuse their names. Just imagine how you'd feel if people confused your name with the guy who came after you. So Elisha takes over from Elijah, and he's a prophet to the northern kingdom, to Israel. And uh, Joram, the son of Ahab, is the king in Israel. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 3 describes him as doing evil, but not as evil as his dad. Uh, Jehoshaphat is king of Judah at that time, and he's a good king. The superpower in the region are the Arameans, based out of Damascus. After them will come the Assyrians, based out of Nineveh, and we know about Nineveh through Jonah. Yeah? And after, after the Assyrians come the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, then Jesus. Uh, we're going to pray, and then we're going to pick up our story from 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1. To 14. Father God, we thank you so much for how you have met us already this morning in your word, in song, in prayer, in communion. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you might continue to meet with us. Father, we ask, Lord, that by your spirit you might take your word Father, which is described as a seed and you might plant it in our hearts. The Father, uh, you might encourage us to tend that plant so that it might grow and become fruitful in our lives. That, Father, we might not just be uh, hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Father, we commit this time to you. We ask, come and work in us by your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 to 14. If you haven't bought your Bible, we have a text written for you. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Do you think that's amazing, though, that the Lord gives Aram victory. God is not just the God of Israel. He's the God of the whole world. 
everything he's doing. And sometimes we can think he's just the God of the Christians, just the God of the church. He's the God of the whole world. Sorry, not part of the message, just an aside. If you're timing me, you should have just pressed pause. Now, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten cents of clothing. The letter he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robe and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father... If the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. I love this story. It's fantastic. From the outset, I need to say that I'm indebted to a podcast that I heard that included this very passage. I am indebted. I will let you know when I use that podcast. Okay. It's like footnoting. Uh, well, here we have an account of a non-Israelite, uh, an Aramean, a Gentile, comes from Damascus getting healed from a skin disease in Israel through the interaction with Israel's prophet, Elisha. There are other players in the drama, but let's see how this account just sort of plays out, how it reflects the truth in the Gospel. Some of the things we will see this morning are things other people do. Or perhaps they are things you have done. Or perhaps they are things you do. For there will be things to avoid this morning and things we want to copy. There are some things, some things you want to recognise when they are being done so that you might be able to respond in a way that will direct people to Jesus or invite them into your relationship with Jesus or share Jesus with them in some way. Our message falls into two sections this morning, each section having five parts. The story starts with Naaman, Aramean general who has a problem. He's really good at what he does, and he's really valued by his king, but he has an incurable skin disease. Often the Bible calls any incurable skin disease leprosy, but not all skin conditions called leprosy are like what we might think leprosy is in a classical sense. The difficulty with the problem is, he cannot fix it. 
And isn't this often how God chooses to enter into people's lives? Through needs they cannot meet. While Naaman has a physical need, and, and while in the Bible often there are physical needs being met by, uh, by Jesus, by prophets, by the church, it doesn't always need to be a physical need. For us, in our middle class environment, we don't have very many physical needs. But we have needs of our security and identity and purpose, belonging, about love. And they can be entry points that God uses for the gospel because the gospel meets those needs in Christ Jesus. Naaman's need receives help from two very unlikely sources. A slave girl kidnapped from Israel and sold to Naaman's family and at least one of Naaman's servants who he brings with him to Israel. The girl, a child, maybe 10 or 11. For those of you who have kids in school, year 4 or 5. Young. She tells her master where she might be able to find healing to meet his need. The servant is older and encourages Naaman to believe in the words from Elisha. Naaman's response falls into five categories. Each of these Five categories can find their way into our lives or we'll see them in the lives of others as we seek to further our relationship with God or the lives of people who might want something from God. In fact, this is what people do by default. When they perceive the God who made the heavens and the earth, the holy, sovereign Lord of all, has something for them, this is what they will do. They will try to get it. These are the things we see Naaman doing. This is Naaman's five-fold method for failure. And for the record, this is the podcast bit. You'll know it's the podcast bit because there's incredible alliteration. Okay, number one. <coughs> Relationships. In verse four, we see how close Naaman is with the king. And so, in order to get him to Israel, to get his problem fixed, Naaman leverages his relationship so that his friend, the king of Aram, will give him a letter to go to the king of Israel in Samaria, telling him to heal Naaman. For the good Naaman has done for his king and for his nation, he will leverage that, trade it for a shot, at being healed of this disease, this skin condition. And just like Naaman uses his relationship with the king to further his, uh, his access to Elisha, there are some who use relationships with people to try and gain access to God. This is the whole priest thing, isn't it? I don't know, countless times, isn't it? People will ask you to pray for them, perhaps. They'll say, they'll say to me, pray for me. I want to say, I'll pray with you. The whole idea of Jesus coming is that we will not need someone to go between us and God. There is one between God and man, the, the Lord Jesus himself. People want to leverage their relationship with someone. So they get someone else to do that for them, to stand there for them. They, might, they think they might gain access to God in this way or even more, a more favourable position in church. I'm reminded of James and John, those followers of Jesus, who asked their mum, can't believe this, they asked their mum to go and ask Jesus whether they could sit at his right and his left when his kingdom comes in, his, in glory. That was not well taken by the other followers of Jesus. Second, resources. We give to get. Note just how many resources this man has. In verse 5, it says he brings 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 changes of clothing, and the letter. For those of you who cannot do the math in your head, uh, changing shekels and talents to kilograms, 
can't monetize that. Or if you don't have footnotes in your Bible to help you, or Google, this is serious coin. 340 kilograms of silver, 69 kilograms of gold. $350,000 worth of silver, $6 million worth of gold. And this is not all he has, this is just all he can get hold of quickly. Well, money might not be able to buy love, Naaman's going to see if it might buy favour with the prophet in Israel. I wonder if sometimes we are like this. Or those people who are trying to share Jesus, who we're trying to share Jesus with, are, are like this. Will God love me more if I give him more? More money? More time? More resources? More or better good works? Do we think, do, do they think that God's favour can be gained by buying it with those things? Or perhaps we think we can gain power in the church through what we do. A bit like Simon Magnus in Acts 8. Yeah, he tries to buy the power to give people the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, reputation. In verse 1, the, the writer tells us all about Naaman through the things he's done, through his reputation. He's a great military commander. Uh, he's a big shot. Highly esteemed by the king, his master. And later in the chapter, Naaman shows us just how close he is with his king. It's not part of our reading, but, but he tells Elisha that he goes in. The king leans on his arm when he goes into the temple to worship. He is so close to his king. I expect that Naaman's reputation was not just a national thing. I expect that everyone in the region knew who he was. It makes him feel better than others. And maybe the pride that it brings him makes his disease so much worse. He can defeat nations, but he can't defeat a skin condition. But will our reputation really do anything for us? Will what our deeds our connections and our resources say about us, really carry anything with God. But still, I think people try. Sometimes I try. Sometimes I'm guilty of believing my own publicity and think that God will use that to change people's lives. Sometimes I think people will think that their goodness brings them into relationship with God. The good things they've done. Their reputation. But we're both. Fourthly, and this is one that is not apparent, is not apparent to white, middle class, western people who live in Wales. Race. It's not apparent because we're part of the dominant race, part of the dominant culture in this nation. But for those who are not, this is probably easier to see. In a lot of ways, it's connected to his reputation. You see in verse 5 how the king of Israel reacts to the letter. He sees it not as a request, but as a command, as a threat by a dominant culture, a dominant race of the region. And this is how it pans out. Naaman will not enter the house of the Israelite. He won't go there. He waits for Elisha to come to him. He expects Elisha will come out and make a great big deal over the fact that it's Naaman standing before him. Naaman, as an Aramean, is superior to the Israelite prophet. He gets angry about having, having to wash in the river of Israel. The Jordan, because he believes the rivers in Aram are so much superior, more superior than what he finds there. And it got me thinking, if we, or, or perhaps if I, somehow, some, somehow withhold good things, even the gospel, from others because of where they come from. Am I always open to learning things about God from someone who's come from another place? 
who have another language or another culture? Do we sometimes look down our nose at people because of where they come from, what they look like or what they can do? Fourthly, reward. Nahum brings all this stuff with him and it's to no avail. For the prophet just sends his servant to go and wash in the Jordan seven times. Naaman wants reward for his efforts. Naaman thinks that while he's not been rewarded for all the stuff he's brought, then at least the prophet should do something spectacular. He, the great, magnificent Naaman, is there. You know, I love how he says, he should come out. I thought he would come out here and, and he would wave his hand over the place, say some words. Spectacular thing he might do. Or perhaps the last Naaman to do something big and mighty that he might be rewarded. This is how the world works. This is how religions work. This is how healing should work. All he's asked to do is something simple. Wash in the Jordan seven times and you'll be healed. Nothing to be rewarded. I wonder if sometimes we think God should reward us. We question God. Thinking that he should have saved us from suffering and pain. Because we've done so many good things. We've done so much, part of the church for decades and decades and decades. We do good things to people and for people. He should save us from bad things. Or he should save those who are basically good as a reward for their goodness. But none of these things gets Naaman what he really needs. His leverage of relationships almost starts a war. No one in God's plan cares about his resources or reputation. His race is of no concern, for honour belongs to God alone. And his rescue will not come as a reward for something. Rather, it comes by God's magnificent grace. God's action in healing Naaman elicits a faith response in him, which comes in just the next verse after our reading finishes. In verse 15, Naaman says, There is no God in all the world except in Israel. And then he does this weird thing. He says, Can I take two bags of dirt with me back home so I might worship? We don't understand that. We don't understand any sort of relationship with land at all. But he did. Halfway. Our second part, of that message flows from the actions of two nameless people. They are nobodies. They've got nothing to leverage to their advantage. They've none of the things that Naaman thought were of benefit to him. No relationships, no resources, no reputation, no race, nothing to give so as to expect a reward. The first is the slave girl we meet in verses 2 and 3. We don't know how long she's been a servant, servant in Naaman's family. Long enough for her to be able to speak to her master, but not so long as she's forgotten the, uh, the prophet who is in Israel. Listen to the words of the servant girl that she offers to her master. Just imagine what it would be like, how much it would take for her to stand up for her faith, her people, and all that even for the benefit of her captors, her enemy. She says to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of leprosy. Similarly, the servant who went uh, to Naaman and encouraged him to do as the prophet said. Naaman is in a rage. He is unpredictable. Perhaps it would be a better time for discretion and not valour. But the servant contradicts the great warrior 
with wisdom and with grace. He tells Naaman to believe in the word of the prophet. It was not about relationships, reputation, resources, race or reward, but a matter of faith, a matter of him believing and doing what the prophet says. Like the servant girl, these nameless people stand in complete contrast with Naaman. They have nothing and desire nothing, but note carefully what they do have. Note the courage it takes for her to stand amid her captors and speak her mind about what she knows about how Naaman might get healed. As a female and as a slave, she had nothing to gain from such a statement, but she had much to lose. Likewise, the servants who interrupt Naaman's ranting and raving, you could easily forfeit your life for either of these actions. See her faith in the God of her people. She knows that he is with the prophet, not the king or the religion, but with Elisha. She has no doubt about what can be done for Naaman. So also the servant who encourages his master to do what the prophet said. Can you imagine what would have happened if he had not been healed? Can you imagine being one of the Naaman's servants, telling him, go and do what the prophet has said, go and dip yourself in the dirty water of the Jordan seven times, and he still comes up with a skin disease? Can you imagine how humiliated Naaman would have felt? Can you imagine how long the servant would have lasted after that? The girl's faith is based on her knowledge, both of the prophet Elisha and of her God. She displays such confidence in that knowledge. And we know that because that's what fuels her courage. She knows what God can do and she knows what God can do through his prophets. And she's not afraid. She's not afraid. She has the conviction of her beliefs to stand on them and to make them her identifier. She is the servant girl who believes that God heals even his enemies. She is the announcer of good news. She's a gospeler. She brings Naaman good news. And the servant is the one who encourages the Gentile general to believe it. Isn't that amazing? Sowers into the life of the Gentile, sowing seed in him. They don't even have names. And finally, perhaps the most telling of all that this young girl has to give is love. But we're not sure about the servant, for the girl, Naaman and his wife and his family, are her captors and her enemy. The girl seeks the best for her captors from the best there is. She wants the blessing of God to fall on her enemy. She's not thinking about her own predicament. She's not anxious about that. Rather, her thoughts and her anxiety are about Naaman. And she knows where to go with that. She doesn't go and say, if you use this cream on your skin, it will feel better. She doesn't try and meet the need in some other way. She says the root of your need can, be only, can only be met by meeting the God of Israel. You've got to go to him. Only he can meet your needs. Only he. She loves them to such an extent that she points them to the best. And sometimes we sort of forget that. We want to love people so much that we'll feed them, we'll clothe them, we might house them, but we still keep the best from them. Because the best thing that we have, really the only thing that we have, the thing that defines us, 
is our relationship with Jesus. That's it. That's the best we have. And if that's not the best we have, then we've got some work to do. If other things are better than that, then we have other gods in our life. Yeah. Matt will be able to share with you about what to do with that. Because that's what he talked about, wasn't it? In the place of relationships, resources, reputation, race and reward, these nameless people have courage, faith, knowledge, conviction and prayer. And, and love, sorry. These attributes are so much the thing that true submission to the Lordship of Jesus through faith in him, that wholehearted acceptance of the gospel brings. If we're serious about this church being light in this city, then we must care for and develop and nurture the attributes of these nameless, honourless slaves rather than those attributes of Naaman. We need to invest in prayer, in scripture and in fellowship so that faith, courage, knowledge, conviction and love might develop in our lives. But so often we want to develop our reputation so that people will admire us. Our resources so that people will think more of us. Our relationships so people will love us. Our race so that we will feel important. And all of this so we will think our gods, whoever and whatever they might be, might reward us. So often we're all about those things. We spend our time doing them, our energy doing them. We spend our resources doing them. But none of that comes from the gospel. It's so much different from what we see the slave girl. So much different from what we see in Jesus. He says in Matthew, 10, in Mark 10.45, he tells us the Son of Man came not to be served, but to, be, but to, to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Should we search our hearts about what motivates our ministry, our servants of God and people. I wonder how much of Naaman's heart would be reflected in ours. But the only ones who really bore fruit to glorify God were two nameless, shamed slaves who knew where help could, we, could be found and who encouraged Naaman to act on the gracefulness of God to let go of his relationships, resources, reputation, race and rewards. For none of them were of any value to meet his need. Only God could meet that. So today let me encourage you, each of you, to examine your heart and see what motivates you. Is it the gospel through which you are saved? The gospel of God's magnificent grace? Does God's good news about his son Jesus and the salvation he has secured for us bring things from, from our heart, things like courage and faith, conviction and love, knowledge? Or are we still tied up trying to leverage relationships, use resources, bank on our reputation, stand on our, on our race and expect reward for all we do? great story. I love this story. It points us to the God of grace. Magnificent God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for, for nameless people in the Bible. Father, we thank you so much for how you honour them. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you might encourage us to be like them as they honoured you. Father, thank you that they point us to Jesus who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for me. Work in us. Bring in us, Father, those things of, of faith, Father, of courage, of knowledge, of conviction, of love. 
Glory to be in our hearts and our lives, we pray, as we live to your glory. We ask in Jesus' name.